Welcome to New Idea Live, the podcast of the Ayn Rand Institute. When discussing the impact of immigration on national security, most anti-immigration advocates focus on the alleged risks that immigration poses, like foreign terrorists and spies living in the US. But they rarely consider the positive contributions that immigrants make to our national security. So how do immigrants impact national security? And why is the debate the debate on this topic so biased against immigrants? Today, we're going to be answering these questions and more. I'm Agustina vergara Sir, a junior fellow at the Ayn Rand Institute, and with me is Onkar Gatte, senior fellow at the Ayn Rand Institute. Welcome, Onkar. Hi, Agustina. Um, so, Onkar, let's begin talking about what this debate is on uh, national security and immigration. Because when researching this topic and when talking to people about this topic, I found that most people don't think about the benefits uh, of immigration to national security because it's not a topic that is widely discussed. You can find every once in a while, every couple of years, an op-ed will come about, like come out about it. And like, if you really want to know about the topic, you really have to, you know, go on a specialized websites to to look into it. But otherwise, it's not really widely discussed. And one thing that you, that when you and I were discussing this, this topic last week, one thing that you told me, well, it's because, you know, people don't readily ask the question, like, what is the impact of national security on, on uh, what is the impact of immigration national security? If they, re if, they ask, if they actually ask the question, they think about, oh, terrorism and all these things that are activated in the mind immediately, the, the border crisis and things like that, but never uh, think about the benefits of national security uh, on, of, sorry, of immigration national security. So why do you think that this is, this is, why is it that it is really not a topic that is discussed? And in fact, what the anti-immigration camp, let's say, is pushing when it comes to national security is, you know, terrorism and uh, espionage and all these claims. Uh, what do you think this is? I think of the, and you put it at the anti-immigration camp so that there's a whole slew of people going, uh, I mean, what people have noticed in, in the Republican Party that it's turned very anti-immigrant. It wasn't always like that. And it wasn't um, uh, even George Bush Jr. Uh, was more open to immigration than what it is now. And if you think of Trump and DeSantis is what people think of the two leading candidates for 2024. They're both trying to one up each other about how anti immigration they are. And so if that's the context that, that when we're talking about the anti immigration camp, I don't think they're anti immigration, because they studied the issues of national security and terrorism and terrorist groups around the world, and thought, oh, we, we have to really clamp down on immigration, otherwise we're going to be uh, supremely vulnerable. They're anti-immigration for other reasons. And this is to, to harp on, well, look at there's terrorists from foreign countries. Um, look, they came into the country and then look what they did. That's to win over people to a view that they've already formed and are trying to win someone over. It's not a genuine looking at what are the actual facts about this and how what's the proper way to think about this. What are facts that might point in a direction other than the conclusion that I want to reach? Um, that's if you were really grappling with this, that's part of what you would do. But if you've already got a conclusion and now you're fishing around for further things you could say to win people over to that conclusion, then what I think you're going to stress is, um, and particularly after 9-11, what you're going to stress is, well, isn't there some connection between immigration and terrorism? And you don't want a 9 -11, another 9-11, do you? So don't we have to clamp down on immigration? That's the kind of argument that you'll put forth to win, win people over to your side. Yes, the 9-11 uh, claim is a popular one, and it's used to, like you said, to try to win people over to this argument. And it's obviously a very sensitive topic, and I'll address that in a minute. But 
first I'd like to ask you, Ankar, so what does, I mean, what does national security actually entail? Because in my, uh, in my research of this topic, I found that, you know, people talk about, okay, terrorism, but then they talk about the border crisis and all, like they conflate a lot of issues together. So what is actually the issue of national security? Yes. So if you think of, of the, the so-called border crisis on the, the southern border, it is true that there is a crisis in some sense because our immigration policy is so fundamentally flawed that it's a lot of people want to come in. It's not clear what the criteria will be for them to be able to come in. Um, the, there's the border guards and so on are trying to prevent people from coming in here to work. And you can't view people coming in to work on farms and so on as a national security threat. So, but, but the, they'll put it as a border crisis and look at the chaos and try to paint it as, well, look, aren't things out of hand and national security means order and so on. So is, doesn't there some connection to the two? And there is no connection. You can think that there's a way in which it's a breakdown of law and order but it's mostly of our own making because our immigration policy is trying to keep out people who want to come here um, and work and trying to prevent Americans from employing these people and so on. And yeah, so so there is some chaos, but it's not a national security crisis. And I put it even more that when you get the lumping together of, well, you might have terrorists and you might have criminals coming across the southern border, and that's all of one package that, oh, but that's the like, look at the threat and our and the national security is at risk. Criminals, they're bad and you don't want criminals. But one just as one doesn't think of a criminal gang in Chicago as, well, this is a threat to our national security. The same as a criminal drug gang that's located in Mexico and not in Chicago. They're bad. They're, it's true the police should take steps against them and so on. But you can't lump all this together under national security. And, and that's why in the description for the podcast, we put it as foreign terrorists and spies. And you can those two fall into the camp or category of it's they pertain to our national security and to foreign policy. Um, but just someone that is a, a thief or a gang member doesn't make him a threat to national security. And if you lump those together, it's again, are you really trying to think carefully about this issue and to figure out like what the proper viewpoint is, or is it you're already anti-immigration and then you're gonna throw out some more things that hopefully will convince people to get on your side? Yes, and part of, like we were just saying, part of this, uh, this lumping together that, that uh, these anti-immigration advocates do is, you know, like put together this issue of, like we were saying, immigration and terrorism. But this claim between this link between immigration and terrorism is actually dishonest, I think, because it's completely blown out of proportion, right? So um, related to what you were saying, uh, about the, you know the difference between like just criminality in general and national security issues. So, to get an idea of just how blown out, out of proportion this claim is about terrorism, if you take from all the causes of death in the United States, you take murder right as a as a category of death. Murder itself is responsible for less than one percent of deaths in the United States. Uh, from the time period of uh, 1975 to 2015, uh, 0.44% of those murders were from actual terrorism. And of that tiny sliver, 0.35, uh, 39%, uh, sorry, were actually foreign born individuals. So yes, they were foreign born individuals that committed terrorism, but it is a very tiny fraction that is portrayed by the anti-immigration advocates as if it were like all terrorism is caught. First of all, terrorism is widespread in a way that is risking actually your life. If you go out, you might die in a terrorist attack. That is not true. But uh, it's a tiny portion of the terrorism that is committed in the United States is committed by foreign born individuals. So I see it as 
just irrational for these calls to keep uh, immigrants out because of this claim. And they use this as evidence, right, that immigrants uh, pose a risk to national security. And I don't think that it is at all. Uh, and, and it's part of and the further, category. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, so part of the categorization, so I think part of what you're objecting to, it's, so it, it, I think it's true that terrorism is not an existential threat to the U.S. Um, and even what happened after 9-11, the much more pertinent threat is what we do in response to 9-11, not that these um, terrorist groups or Al-Qaeda Al has any real possibility of toppling the U.S. government or something like that. It is, but they can do real damage. And if our response is zero or worse than zero, which I think it turned out to be in regard to what we did in Afghanistan and Iraq in, in response to 9-11, the, 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 that's the real threat to U.S. national security that will um, undermine our own uh, defense and do things that further endanger, further embold the, in this case, it's the Islamic terrorists throughout the Middle East, which is what I think happened actually after 9-11. But it's the, so, but that's not to diminish that this isn't a threat, but you can't go from um, some immigrants are terrorists or some would-be immigrants or some are terrorists to, well, maybe this immigrant or that immigrant is a terrorist. So, and this, again, it, if you were thinking about national security and really concerned about it, what you're what you would be proposing is the mechanisms to really focus on and target terrorist groups. And, and that includes monitoring terrorist groups abroad and so on and to figure out like, who are they recruiting, who are potential people that might come and try to sneak into the U.S. and so on you wouldn't have some kind of blanket surveillance of hundreds of thousands of would-be immigrants as though they all might be a terrorist. Like, there's, that is, um, it's so illogical. Uh, and if you understand sort of the roots of terrorism and that they're fighting for an ideological cause and so on, the idea that you can just like take some random person in, in a foreign, who's born in a foreign country and think, well, some foreigners have been terrorists, so maybe this person is. That is um, that is not real thinking. Yes, and uh, I think I agree that a more targeted approach would be even like much more effective in in trying to prevent these threats. But you know, after nine eleven, all these uh, you know extra security layers were put in place. You know, and this anti-immigration rhetoric started like resurfacing. Like, like we were saying, immigration equals or can potentially equal terrorism. And in fact, the 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 nine eleven the nine the eleven terrorist attacks are you know used a lot for for this as as we discussed. But the fact is that it's not. And this I think this shows part of why the, the one of the main reasons this debate is dishonest. They portray 9-11 as if it had been actually caused by immigration. But the, the reality is that of the uh, 19 terrorists that uh, attacked, uh, that, that uh, perpetrated 9-11, all of them were in non-immigrant visas, right? They were, uh, uh, 18 of them were on, a vi on visitor visas, so tourist visas, and one of them was on a student visa. So um, they were not immigrants. So immigrants is, is an immigrant is someone that comes to live in the United States. And it's really hard to immigrate here, as we'll discuss later. So the processes that go um, that that a person has to go, go through to become a resident of the United States and actually immigrate to the United States, these people didn't go through these processes at all. So when people blame immigration on 9-11 on immigration, it's really, really dishonest. And I read takes that say like, well, it's temporary immigration and we should really reconsider temporary immigration. But then it's like, okay, temporary immigration, I mean, as far as I know, is a contradiction in, term, in, in terms, right? It's either it's temporary or it's immigration, but what, should, what they're really saying is we don't want students here and we don't want potentially tourists here because 
you know, they could be terrorists, right? So it's really a claim that it shows, I think, a little bit of the dishonesty of this debate in general. Yeah, and you can think of it, that same point from the political angle that they think of it as it's palatable politically that, and this is a major part of this is Trump's campaign uh, in 2016, and, and, and it's continuing now, and, and DeSantis and other Republicans are coming on board, that it flies politically that, oh, we're against immigration, we don't want these people here. But if it was, as you're saying, so if it was, yeah, but these were people were tourists, and so maybe we shouldn't have tourist visas. That would create politically much more question about well, what's going to happen to tourism in the U.S. and what is it? and like this is a major industry and so on. And it, are we saying that, that we're not going to issue or we're going to have way fewer tourist visas and so on? And and there would be some political pushback on that. But that what they found is you can do it for immigration in a certain kind of way. And so yeah, so that 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 they will then want to paint 9/11 as they were literally immigrants or received immigrant visas and so on. Yeah, that flies politically. But again, it tells you that it's this is not honest thinking about what ha actually happened. And uh, like, shouldn't we be proposing that we should have far fewer tourist visas? If, if that if we're really saying that's was the issue was the visas or the papers they got, they didn't get immigration papers, they got tourist papers. So or most of them. So is like, is that our target? And why not? And there's no real grappling with that. Yes, and the, this debate and like another big reason why it's so dishonest is it's, it not only presents these these issues as they were facts to uh, as evidence that immigration poses a risk to national security, but also they never discuss uh, and take into account the benefits that immigration brings to national security. And like we said earlier, like most people are not aware of this because it's not discussed. So what are these benefits? So uh, there are many benefits of immigration and national security in general. We're gonna discuss only, only two. And one of them is uh, immigration has actually a really positive Im uh, impact on military readiness. So just to give some background, uh, to be able to enlist in the military, a person has to be either a citizen of the United States or be a legal permanent resident, meaning uh, this person has to have a green card. So a green card for an immigrant is, you know, the entry ticket to the military. But the problem is that a green card is extremely hard to obtain. And I'm not going to go into the details of why this is because we could have a three hour podcast talking just about this but it is really hard to obtain. And in fact, it is virtually impossible for most immigrants to come to America, uh, to actually immigrate, which means become a legal permanent resident. Uh, most immigrants that live in America, uh, most uh, people that live in America and have an intention to settle here are on one of the 80 plus types of visas that uh, the United States offers, but they don't have an immigrant visa, meaning, among the things that they cannot do is they cannot enlist in the military. Um, like I said, because it, it the, the military is not able to recruit from, from this percentage of the population, which is around 15% of the population that is foreign uh, born in the United States. So part of the reason why uh, the, 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 the we don't see more immigrants in the last several years in the in the military is because they need a green card and, a, and the United States really, really does not like to give green cards to foreign born people. So and the reasons for that are, are like we, we can go into that a little bit later, but, but let's go into a little bit of the background and the history of uh, immigrants in the United States, which is a very rich history. I'm just going to touch on a couple of of facts here. But immigrants have been uh, serving the military since literally the American Revolution. There were many immigrants uh, fighting in the revolution. The most, uh, the one that we we all know is Marquis de Lafayette, right? And Marquis de Lafayette served very honorably in the in the military. 
and after the war there's a quote from him that i that i actually really like and he said it is the pride of my heart to have been one of the earliest adopted sons of america he was really proud to he identified with america and he was really proud to have uh, served in america um and then in every single armed conflict that the united states has been involved in without endorsing uh, a lot of those conflicts, especially the most recent ones, immigrants have had a, a big role. Uh, in World War I, uh, about half a million immigrants served in the military, which is about 20%, uh, 18% of all the soldiers that fought for Amer in, from uh, the United States that fought in World War I. World War II, similar numbers, 300,000 immigrants served in the armed forces. Many of them were... Uh, Jewish, uh, German-Jewish German uh, people that came to America. America gave them citizenship and sent them back to fight uh, in the war. And up to, you know, the 2016, there were about half a million foreign-born veterans uh, of the armed forces that were residing in the United States, which is about 3% of the total veteran population uh, in the United States. So, Immigrants have always been a crucial part of the of the army of, of of the military, and they have made great contributions, and they have helped not only with a lot of uh, intelligence, especially like in World War II, immigrants were responsible for a lot of the intelligence in in Germany, but also in uh, adding numbers to the military to to the recruitment, right? And uh, during the Bush administration, there was some recognition of this, and the there was a program called the MAVNI program, which is uh, an acronym for Military Accessions Vital to National Interest. It was a program from the Department of Defense uh, that ran from the Bush administration until uh, on and off immediately until the um, Trump administration. Trump got rid of this program. In where, like in this program, legal non-immigrants, meaning people who were in the United States on visas other than an immigrant visa, meaning all the 80 plus categories of visas that the United States offers but not residency, uh, were these people that were here in the United States that had certain skills that were valuable to the military, such as speaking other languages, like Farsi, or Russian, uh, Arabic, and all and other types of dialects that are really hard uh, to find people that speak those languages, or that have a profession, that were skilled, that uh, were otherwise skilled in professions such as healthcare, and that wanted to uh, join the military, were recu recruited for the US military without needing this green card. Um, and this program is no longer active. And right now we're dealing with a historic uh, crisis, a recruitment crisis in the United States. And uh, Onkar, I think you wanted to remark something about the MAVNI program. Um, well, it was the the when you say it no longer exists, it's no longer in place. Why do you think it's no longer in place? What, what, what do you think the actual what do you think the actual arguments were, and what are the actual causes of why it's no longer in place? Um, well, the argument was that there was, um, from what I understand and from what I've read, there were national security concerns uh, about these foreign-born individuals. They were saying, okay, you're a foreign-born individual, you have ties to foreign countries. Well, of course, I was born abroad, right? Like, I, that's what uh, these people that were recruited would, would say. And uh, from what I read, the reasons, and there are a few opeds about this and, and accounts of what happened, the reasons that these people were, uh, not only that the program ended, but also uh, a lot of the people that were, that had been actually recruited to the Madney program were dismissed, were really not reasons that, that made any sense. Like, for instance, like I said, like, okay, this person has foreign ties because his grandfather was... Uh, or there's a security concern because his grandfather was a communist in China, and oh, but that doesn't say anything about the individual. And of course, I mean, if you're born abroad, you're gonna have 
ties are broken. You're going to have parents, you're going to have sisters, you're going to have friends, all kinds of things. So I think the real reason that the Mavni program stopped is because they really, there's, it was not really a concern with national security because in fact, immigrants, like we're saying, contribute to national security. And some of the recruits of the Mavni programs were really, really valuable assets for the, for the military. I think the reason is they just don't want immigrants. They don't want foreign born individuals. They want, they don't want immigrants in America and they're not grappling. It's not about national security. It's just that they don't want people, uh, foreign born people here. What do you think? Yeah, it, yeah it, it is, it's part of the reason to think that the concern with national security is a smokescreen that if you will actually go so far as do things that are harmful to national security and you've recruited valuable people into the military and then it's oh so long we, we don't want you anymore that that's not a concern with national security that's you don't actually care about national security what you care about is being anti-immigrant and when it seems like you can paint that under the light of national security you do so but you're not actually interested in the issue of national security. So it's it's um, the it's not just sort of they're focused too much on the negatives, not the positives. That in the end, I think that it's not a driver that what they, they that they're concerned about national security and they will prioritize their anti-immigration above national security. That when the two come into tension, that well. I'm anti-immigration, so I want to send these people away, but I'm supposed to be pro-national security, so shouldn't we be keeping some of these people? What will trump is their anti-immigration? And I think this the, the, this kind of program and the attitude towards it is evidence of that. And more broadly, as you said, the, the, the whole imp important context here is that the military itself talks about a shortage, a shortage of people a difficulty of recruiting. So, and there's plenty of evidence to think a subset of immigrants would be interested and motivated to enlist in the military if we made that easy. And as you indicated with some of the stats, it's not as though the military has no experience with immigrants, like it will be chaos now in our armed forces because we've got all kinds of immigrants it's had immigrants throughout its history it knows how to handle that and again so if you were concerned with national security this would be a major question about like shouldn't we be increasing immigration from the perspective of we need to recruit people that we have a a, a military that's at the capacity that the military leaders thinks that we need given what they've been charged with in, in terms of executing our foreign policy. And it really is, it's the same phenomenon as we have shortages elsewhere. I was, um, I have a strip mall within walking distance of the house and we we're walking there this weekend. I'd say half the places had help wanted. We need part-time or full-time people. And that's again, I mean, one way these businesses could find such people is if we had immigration laws that made it much easier for people who want to work in the U.S. to actually come to the U.S. and work. And, and you have shortages like that. And it should not surprise when you walk around a mall and you see all these signs, it should not surprise you that, well, the military might have issues, too, about recruiting and that immigration, just as it's relevant to businesses that are looking for uh, workers that it's relevant for the military looking for people to enlist and to serve in the military. And it, so, but again, that the fact that it's not really talked about and they don't feel the need to say, well, I'm on the side of national security. So don't you have to think about, well, what is the impact of immigration on some of these kinds of things? And that, the, that they feel, no, I don't really need to talk about this it tells you that national security is not actually what is driving their concerns and their attitude. Yeah, I was reading a report yesterday about the recruitment crisis currently going on. And I was reading that for uh, fiscal year 20, 2023, 
the army, the Air Force, and the Navy are expected to fall short of thousands of uh, people for the recruitment goals. So, and and they're not recruiting from uh, from the immigrant population, right? So, the fact that the Q said no one is talking about it. I was reading uh, about Nikki Haley, Nikki Haley, the, the Republican candidate, uh, presidential candidate. She was talking about immigration, like securing the border and calling it a national security crisis. And then she was talking about um, the military and how we can, you know, uh, make our military stronger and better. There was absolutely no mention of immigration or even an indication that we might need a strong, like we might recruit from uh, from the immigrant pull in, in America to, to make the, the military stronger. Of course, the recruitment crisis is very complex. There are many factors going on there. That is, it's not that, okay, we recruit immigrants and the problem is solved. There's clearly a deeper problem here, but it could greatly help. And the fact that no one is even, you know, exploring the possibility, non, I mean, not, I'm not, I shouldn't say no one because there are people uh, that are really looking into this and that have uh, really uh, advocated for this one such person is um, uh, Margaret Stock, an immigration uh, lawyer that is very respected and he was actually the one that spearheaded the, the MAVNI program. But all these mainstream candidates, right, these mainstream politicians are not pushing for this and not even trying to consider this. It really shows, like you said, that it's not really a, they're not really primarily concerned about national security, I don't think. And so we can move on to another reason why uh, immigrants greatly contribute to national security. And that is the skilled workers uh, that the military needs in technology and cybersecurity. The immigration population can provide a lot of those skilled workers. So Part of the, the issue that's going on is that the United States is falling uh, short of people with STEM degrees. Um, so because we don't have people enough people with STEM degrees, it's really hard for the military to recruit people that are experts on AI and cybersecurity and other things that are essential to, the, to national security that are not necessarily you know, actual soldiers, right? Part of the reason why there's this crisis going on with STEM students, it's not just that, you know, American students don't go into STEM professions. That is one, uh, that is part of the problem, but part of the issue also is that the United States receives and trains students on STEM careers. And these students come here generally on an F1 visa, on a student visa, but then the United States trains these students and then kicks them up. Right, because it is really hard, like I said, for anyone to really stay here, to to immigrate here, to get a to get a green card. So these students study here, then some of them are able to do uh, uh, optical practical training, which is uh, basically a period of time after their student visas in which they can actually work, uh, have a, a work permit, and actually work because when you're on a student visa you cannot work in very in very rare exceptions that you can work but after the the your studies finish sometimes you get the chance to study to work on the field that on on something that is related to the field that you studied but after that it's really hard for students to stay because they have to apply to another type of visa like an h1b visa and those are really hard to obtain so the us is effectively training all these students and you know, kicking them out. Um, meanwhile, what's interesting is that China, and I'm not trying to, this is just because I want to highlight just how a, a, a communist dictatorship can actually identify the need to foster and to keep talent. And America is not doing that. China has the explicit goal of training and attracting all the best talent in STEM professions. Xi Jinping himself said that, and I will quote him from one of his speeches in 2022, we will value talented people, nurture them, attract them, and put them to good use. 
No effort should be spared and no rigid boundaries drawn in the endeavor to bring together the best and the brightest from all fields for the cause of the party and the people. So, of course, there are a ton of collectivistic uh, elements there, like put people to good use and for the cause of the party and for the people. But the fact is also is that China is recognizing the importance, not just of uh, training the STEM students themselves, but also attracting as many STEM students as possible to China to work for, uh, you know, in, for the cause of the party and the people. So the fact that a communist dictatorship can see the importance that this, uh, that this talent has, and America is, does not. And not only that, is that America sees these students these, these foreign-born individuals that want to be, or, or the people that want to be immigrants as a threat, I think it's, 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 it's revealing of the state that we're in. Yes, I, I put it the, the, so as you said, I mean, obviously for China, it's a whole collectivistic, nationalistic perspective. And, um, if someone's dreaming to work in China, given this authoritarian government, which has incredible power, and part of what it wants to use technology for is to survey and clamp down, monitor, and keep the whole population in line, it's you. That that's not a legitimate activity to be participating in. But if you think of it from the perspective of you've got a student from Ethiopia and they've come to the US to a university, they've studied STEM and they don't wanna go back to their country. And if they feel like China is more welcoming of them with a whole authoritarian government than the US is, that's shameful. And it's shameful for the US that that, that could you could po someone could possibly think oh well i could have a better life and a better career in china than i could in the us i'll be a researcher i'll be productive and so on and the us is uninterested or is it seems like it's actively trying to get me to go home um and that china seems to have open arms for that that i mean so there are going to people who will make that choice and it is shameful from the perspective of the us that that's the choice that we're offering them. And it's again, just like in the issue of recruiting for the military and so on. The broader context is if the US were open um, to people coming here to work, and I was talking about the help wanted signs and so on, one aspect of that would be immigrants would also enroll in the military, enlist in the military, or some part of the family that comes, they would enlist. Um, and that that is, good from the perspective of the operations of the US military. And the same here, the, the issue for STEM and technology is that the whole private sector uh, and leading tech companies in the US want that the immigration laws are much more open and inviting to people from around the world who uh, are bright, accomplished in this area or have enormous potential in the area. and the U.S. should be, a, they should have the experience that it's, we're, have open arms. Like if, if this is what you want to do with your life, then you're an American in, in the deeper sense. You might have not have citizenship and so on, but this is what America is about. It's about productivity. It's about pushing the boundaries. Um, it's about exploring the new. And the people from around the world should feel, yeah, like, that I can come to America and do that. And the fact that our immigration is so not that, and that, oh yeah, you can come and study and so on, but don't dare work. Don't dare actually do anything that's actually productive and so on. That you go home, go elsewhere and do that. That is so anti what America, that the what the es essence of America is about, that that's why it's shameful and it, it's, it's an important detail, it's a detail, but it's an important detail that like if these people feel more welcome in China, we've got a problem. <clears throat> yes, definitely. And 
these people are the people that come here to America to study and and engage in uh, you know STEM. These are really smart people, and these are generally, from what I read, the people that, especially uh, because we're talking about China, uh, Chinese students that come here. I can say this anecdotally because I have studied with uh, people from China. Granted, I have studied the law with people from China, not STEM professions, but generally they don't see this, their country favorably. They don't want to live under uh, authoritarianism. They come here and literally, for me personally, my experience, every single person, uh, for a student from China that I have talked to, wants to have the chance to immigrate to America. But that is, like we're discussing, almost impossible to do. Um, but the fact also that, you know, the, these people that are like really anti-immigration are, you know, they're anti-immigration and also they're really worried about China and with legitimate reasons for, for, for like every part of it. But they're worried, you know, they have this race with China and we, we've seen presidential candidates that talk about China and how we're going to keep China in check and all of that. But then don't even address the fact that we have all we're training all these Chinese students that we're sending them back there. We're not giving them a chance here. Uh, that is really, I think, dishonest. And it's not like you were saying, it's, it's the fact that students feel can feel more welcome in China than they can in the United States. I think it's, like you said, really anti-American. But it's also not just China because of an interest in, you know, uh, beating the U.S. U.S. in the arms race. If you go just to Canada, Canada has this program that it's called the the um, uh, Express Entry. So basically, what happens is if you're smart, if you're smart, if you have a college degree, uh, if you speak English or French, you can get a green card in about six months. So if you have a, a young person from uh, China or India, even the, we have a lot of STEM students from from India too, you know they're gonna they, they, they these are smart people they say okay i can either go to canada and they're gonna give me a green card a, a residency in about six months or i can go to america and be on a visa and become best friends with an attorney with an immigration attorney to apply for to renew my visa over and over again and try to meet all these requirements and maybe i'll get a green card in 20 or 30 years who do you think a smart person is going to choose they're going to choose canada right And, and this again, so, so we yeah, put it, the, this issue, you can't seriously think that terrorism is an issue here. So for, for the people from China and more broadly, these foreign nationals who are studying in the STEM fields and so on, it, the concern can't be terrorism, that, that that's the reason we have to send all these people home and so on. Um, and it, the, I mean, they've been here studying for a number of years and so on. And it, you have zero reason to think terrorism. There's some reason to think spying is a concern and particularly in regard to China and spying here, I include, so it's spying on governmental facilities, policies, classified documents, and so on, trying to get at those, but also what they call corporate espionage of trade secrets, of trying to, those are real issues. Um, but it's again, what a, what a real policy that is focused on national security would entail is making distinctions, not, oh, well, some of these people might be spies, so let's not have any of these people, let's send them all home, not give anybody uh, ability to immigrate. And so it would be, like, how do we actually uncover these networks of spies? How do we monitor this? And so it would be very targeted. And when you read some of the officials who work in the, who've worked or work in U.S. immigration, part of what they say, which is, it should not be surprising, that given how much of a focus of the U.S. immigration is on trying to identify people who want to work and stopping them from doing that. Um, it's, are you, you have a student visa? Do you, are you also have a part-time job? You can't do that. So, so all that, if you put so much effort, energy resources into that, 
where are those resources coming from? Well, in part, they're coming from the, the people and efforts to monitor actual terrorists, to monitor spy rings and so on. It's these things exist, but the idea that the way to target this is kind of blanket prohibitions on immigration. And the, and the real problem is we want to work. That again, it's not just that it um, is not taking national uh, security and national interest issues seriously. It in the end jeopardizes them because what one the government should be doing, it's not actually doing because it's preoccupied with trying to ferret out the thousands and hundreds of thousands of people who want to work and oh my god that's a crime so we have to go after these people and it that jeopardizes our national security yes and, and i want to pick up on what you said about you know treating putting all immigrants kind of like in the same in in the same bag of course there's going to be you know, criminals within the illegal immigrant population, the immigrant population, they're going to be spies, etc. But you cannot treat these outliers as evidence. And one one thing that is very common that people do, and you and I were discussing this the other day as well, is when discussing why the, the criminalization of immigration, the people will like be like, Oh well, but you need we need to secure the border, and we cannot have the illegals here because look, and they sent like a laundry list of articles from 1995 to last year or whatever, with you know all these uh, these headlines like illegal immigrant murders someone or uh, they dismantle a, a ring of uh, you know uh, drug traffickers comprised by illegal immigrants. Like, of course, if you if you really go looking for, uh, you know, what crimes are illegal, like they're, they're obviously there are criminals within the, the immigrant community, but you cannot treat that, those outliers as evidence of anything. In fact, immigrants, whether illegal or, or not, are much less likely statistically to uh, commit crimes than, than Americans are, and the Native Americans are. And the fact that uh, this is treated as evidence, it's, I think, really really dishonest is picking and choosing and then focusing like you said on the on the wrong things just as let's close the border entirely or, or let's you know let's fix the border as as presidential candidate like to say nowadays but there's no real grappling with the issue and clearly national security is not really the concern that they they have in this in this regard um one thing that you and I were discussing the other day that I found really interesting is we were drawing a, a comparison between, you know, if the energy debate that is prominent and and the and this debate about national security. And I found it illuminating because, you know, when people when anti-immigration advocates discuss national security and they don't take into account all these benefits that immigrants have on national security. It reminds me of the discussion when it comes to energy and the use of fossil fuels when people will say, okay, fossil fuels are, are, are bad, they cause all this environmental damage and pollution and all of that. But then they also don't take into consideration the benefits that fossil fuels provide, uh, not just in, in terms of, you know, providing reliable energy and all of that, but also in terms of the, the fact that more fossil fuels is actually provides the solution to many of the problems that the fossil fuels, fuels cause. So would you like to spend more on, on that analogy, Onkar? I found what you said the other day really illuminating. It's part of thinking how a debate is dishonest, like what the dishonesty involved is. And often what it is, is you're holding a conclusion for other reasons, and then you're marshalling supposed arguments and evidence in favor of your conclusion. But you'll only take the things that support it, because what's the, the absolute is the conclusion I've reached for other reasons. And now I'm going to pretend, well, these are the reasons. The reasons I'm anti-fossil fuels is because it pollutes um, and our air quality goes down and so on. So we need to get rid of fossil fuels. But 
the actual reason most people are anti-fossil fuels is they've bought in one way or another to environmentalism as an ideological approach. And what environmentalism does is it causes a person to think the, the primary value is nature or really wilderness that it's it's the it's nature untouched by human um, interest human hands it's pristine it's wild it's natural not artificial and artificial means man-made it means man has intervened that that's when we look at issues of value that's how we should look at value that's what we're trying to accomplish and then Everything man-made, particularly man-made at, at a grand scale, where you're having real impact on the world, where you're reshaping the world. And what human civilization does is it reshapes the world. Um, the, the world in the 21st century looks nothing like it did in uh, 20 centuries ago. The, the amount of industrialization um, and human effort work to transform the world into a place that's much more hospitable for human beings. That, I mean, and if you just look at the combination today of the, the globe's population and the average living standard, it still could be dramatically higher than what it is. But it's, we've got an enormous population and many people living in a way that no one has ever lived before. That is, the quality and quantity of life is better than it has ever been. And when you look at the stats of people who have been have got out of poverty in the last 40, 50 years around the globe, it's staggering. And all this is achieved by industrial scale energy. I mean, it's it's the crucial thing of advancing human civilization, civilization is having um, at one's disposal an amount of energy that makes possible transforming the world and you're not just using muscle power you're using energy machines technology to transform the world and so in evaluating fossil fuels that would have to be the context the context would have to be the enormous positives it brings and then you can think about well does it also have some negatives and so on the fact that they don't look at it like that is because what's driving them is not, I'm trying to figure out if fossil fuels are good or bad for human civilization. That's not the question. If that were the question, you would have to look at all the positive. The same if immigration, like what is its impact? Is it positive or negative on national security? Then you would be looking at the host of things that um, are relevant to thinking about immigration and national security. But if you're already anti-immigrant, that you're not interested in that whole range. You're only interested in the range that's negative and will point to, like, isn't this another reason we should be anti-immigrant? And it's the same in regard to fossil fuels. They're not actually looking, like, why do we use so much fossil fuels? What would life be like if we weren't able to do that? What is life like in countries that they don't have much use of energy? Are living standards higher? Is population bigger? No, it's in the countries that are industrialized that you have um, high standards of living. And so if the question really were, are fossil fuels pro-life or anti-life on net, you'd be looking at this range of facts. But if you're already anti-fossil fuel because it interferes with wilderness, with pristine nature and so on, then you're only going to seize on, oh, but doesn't it cause some air pollution and doesn't it do this and that and ignore the fact that for if you look at just um, the standard of living for over the last hundred years, there's a correlation between use of energy and a growing standard of living. And the correlation is causal. It's you need um, massive energy and machines in order to build a civilization. And so it, it's this, it's this, the dynamics are similar for the two debates for the same reason, because they're anti-fossil fuels, not because they're looking at human life and thinking, what is the relationship of fossil fuels to human life? They're looking at pristine nature and saying this interferes with it. And similarly for the immigration debate, they're already anti-immigration. And so they're not actually trying to think about 
what is the impact of immigration on national security? What they're trying to find is things that will support their anti-immigrant view. And I think that it's interesting to me that a lot of the people that are generally anti-immigration will be uh, in favor of, of guns, right? And will defend the Second Amendment. But when you treat the the Second Amendment, the, 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 the gun issue and the ownership of guns with the same standard that they treat immigration, they really don't like it. And it's like, okay, no. Like, for instance, you they, they will... Uh, give you a laundry list of uh, terrorist attacks or crimes committed by Im immigrants. But then when you do the same, you say, okay, all these shootings or, and, and all these uh, violence caused by, by guns, they will say, okay, wait, well, no, but that's not, not evidence. So they don't treat the, the two things in the same way. Yes. The, the, and, and it's very telling that they don't, that it, in regard to guns, they have a bit more of a, an individual American response. I think not always there's some disingenuous arguments in regard to it, but the, it's, if you, if, if, if in the debate, it's like gun owners do this and gun owners do that. It's no, you can't lump all gun owners together. And that it, it's the fact that someone carries out a shooting and yes, he was able to purchase guns and he was, it, it, and, and like lawfully had, had these guns and stuff doesn't mean all lawful gun owners are potential shooters or potential criminals or potential domestic terrorists and so on. You can't do this kind of collectivist lumping together. Um, and like the, it's very much they'll respond like that. And to that extent, that's true. Like you can't just lump people together like that and find, well, this there was a person who bought a gun and did something bad. So I guess there's something suspect about gun owners and so on. But they'll do it in regard to immigration. And that, again, tells you that it's um, that you can have this kind of difference in the, the argument and in one they'll rebel against it and another they won't just not rebel against. It. They'll use the kind of argument that they're objecting to. And the other that's telling you that something really bad in terms of the thinking and the motivation is going on because it's not that difficult to get, yeah, like that's basically the same thing. If you say somebody born in a foreign country and wanted to come to, uh, came to the US and engaged in crime, that somehow you can, oh, I guess like everybody in a foreign country who wants to come to the US might engage in crime or something like they're all, we have to all look at them carefully and they're all suspect and maybe we need things to stop them. So, and, and to get well with gun owners and we can lump them all together and maybe we need regulations that make it very hard to purchase a gun or impossible to purchase which is just like the immigration restriction you can't come here so it's not that difficult to see though these are basically the same things and if you have a radically different attitude towards one than the other something is going wrong in one's thinking like it's not thinking anymore it's something else and something unfortunately, I think pretty ugly is driving it that you're anti-immigration um, because you've got some kind of problem with immigrants, a kind of xenophobia, a kind of tribalism that I want the country to look and act the way I want it to and nothing to change. And I don't want to see people with different color skin. And so it's um, uh, otherwise you would not be prone to painting immigrants with one broad brush and object to when gun owners are painted with and falsely like painted with again they're all potential shooters or terrorists or something so i agree that that is the motivation for a lot of this debate and one reason why is this honest but one thing that i'm curious to know onkar if you have an answer to this is I mean, we've shed light on to why, you know, people that are anti-immigrants, you know, decide not to grapple with the benefits of immigration and all these issues. But don't, why is it that people that are pro-immigration also do not really, the mainstream people is do not really grapple with, with this issue either? Yeah, 
I think, unfortunately, there are not many people who are pro-immigration today. And I do not put the Democrats or the progressives or the liberal, however they might be characterized today, as they're pro-immigration. So I think there are some people in the country, and, and you referred to some people's research and so on, who are genuinely pro-immigration, but there's they're not very large groups anymore. And I, I certainly don't think in terms of the political parties, think of, well, the Republicans are anti-immigration and Democrats are pro-immigration. They're anti-immigration in different kinds of ways. And it's more a leading issue now for the Republicans than for Democrats. But just in regard, the Democrats and Biden trying to shift a little more towards being seen as being pro-union and that kind of, there's an element that's very anti-immigration in that whole camp and catering to that camp is in part catering to people who are against immigration for um, uh, various bad reasons in the end. But so I don't think of it them as pro-immigration. And to the extent that they talk about, oh, we should have more immigrants, it's all in a altruistic uh, framework. It's there's refugees, asylum seekers, poor people who, um, uh, I mean, look at the poverty in their countries, look at the gang warfare. And so, and it's true that there is poverty in other countries. There is gang warfare. There is people fleeing these. There are refugees and asylum seekers. And it's, I don't think one's attitude should be, oh, well, they shouldn't be able to get in. So, but the essence of immigration is that the people find those conditions intolerable, that they want to come to something better and make something better of their lives. So, and, and that's what really immigration is. It's not just fleeing the war. It's, I want to go to some place that's better than this. And that, that America has been a country of immigrants. Part of what that means is that people thought, in America, I can build a better life. I'll be free. And which means free to build my own life. Not it's going to be handed to me, it's going to be given to me, but I'll have the freedom to pursue it. And if you, that's what it means to be pro-immigration, that it's the people like that. Yes, a free country should be a place that they're welcome. And welcome means not, oh, we grudgingly let you in or something. It's your welcome. It's, this is the kind of person we want to be around. This is the way that we see ourselves. And we see anybody uh, around the world with this attitude as one of us. So part of what it meant, an American is not you're born on this geographic soil. It's that you have a certain kind of attitude. That's what it means to be pro-immigrant. And then, so then you're pro-individual. You're pro-building, creating, working, not oh, look at the poverty. It's look what they would have be able to do if they were not circum, um, if their circumstances were not, they're part of a country that either has no government or a corrupt government or authoritarian government or totalitarian government and so on. Imagine what they could do. It's, so it's not a focus on their suffering, but a, a focus on the potential and on the individual and the potential of the individual. And I don't think that it, that is not the way the Democrats look at um, immigration. It's part of why immigration policy changed to be about family reunification. And so that's painting it all under an altruistic kind of light. And so on this issue, do the Democrats care about immigration and national security? Um, National security is a self-interested perspective. It's a, the self-interest of the nation, but a proper conception of that is the self-interest of the citizens of the nation, and the government is in part responsible and set up to achieve that. But it's a, it's not an altruistic mission. It's a self-interested mission. And so if what re, to the extent that they're interested in immigration, it's from a perspective of this kind of altruistic perspective, the issues of national security wouldn't cross their minds. Okay, Ankar, that is very clarifying, I, I think, on the on why Democrats and so-called pro-immigration people do not really 
push for for more immigrants in the military and STEM careers. Uh, but we're at time now, um, so for our audience, some resources that uh, one resource that you actually may want to look at to learn more about uh, the topic of immigration today is a previous podcast episode we did on the debate over the right to immigrate. Uh, next week's show we have with Zima with Going and Tristan Delich on uh, Wednesday, July 5th, In Defense of Self-Esteem, a very interesting philosophical uh, topic. And for the future, please send us your questions. We might do a few Q&A episodes. And, and if you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe to our channel on YouTube and subscribe uh, wherever you're, you listen to your podcasts. And if you're watching this, please leave a review, comment, and like, or share the, the episode. And if you have any questions, uh, suggestions for future episodes, please send us an email to newideal at einrang.org. We read all of your emails and we reply, reply to many. So thank you, Onkar, for this discussion today. It was, for me, it was very illuminating and clarifying. So thank you, and thank you to all of our audience for joining us today, and see you next time.